and Matt Frazier, Business Development Manager. Take it away, gentlemen. Yes, we're finally here with uh, the S5 Mark II. Pretty awesome, right? We're, we need to get somebody to call you in every single time on Linux Live. We have to get a host like that for you so that someone can usher you onto stage like this again. So are you volunteering for the job? Not at all. OK. All right, let's all right, go. Let's go. Everybody's <laughs> waiting to hear what we have to say about autofocus, right? Yeah. So. Um, for those uh, joining us online, uh, th this is a little bit of a different uh, setup than we've normally done for Lumix Live. So we are here, we're going to be talking about the uh, focusing system and, and just kind of the details about it. So we've got the camera hooked up here. Matt's going to start in a second. And we're going to actually walk you through some of the different setups, how this works. You'll be able to use me as a model for once. And, and it's, yeah, so let's kind of uh, just jump right into it. Yeah, the best part will be we're on uh, handheld mics because of all the interference here. So. Uh, Sean will periodically be holding Mike to my mouth so that I can focus on him. So, why don't we go ahead and start by talking about how? Let's start by talking about how the camera is configured when you first get one, right? When you first unbox it. So, the camera when you get this out of the box, the autofocus system is going to be set to one area autofocus, and it's not going to have any of the subject detection turned on. This is sort of a legacy of how all the Lumix cameras have operated for, you know, probably five, six, Forever. seven years. Yeah. So that's why it starts this way. Um, what we want to make sure people do when they're using our autofocus, especially for subject detection, uh, the starting point, at least to begin with for people, should always be to set it to our full area autofocus. So with full area autofocus selected, um, this is going to be all 779 points of the autofocus. So we're looking everywhere. We're looking at absolutely every point to see what we can find. Once we're in that mode, we can then hit the up arrow, and that's going to, you'll see a little person's head or body just appeared on the screen. What that's showing us is that we now have some sort of subject detection. In this case, we're in human detection. But when I press the display button, that's going to give us options. So. What we're finding is that people are putting it into face and eye, because a lot of other camera companies, face and eye actually is human detection. It actually detects bodies and other body parts, right? Um, what we mean by face and eye is literally just faces and eyes. So let Sean and I kind of show you what's going to happen here. So when I set this into face and eye detection, and I point the camera at Sean, so let me go ahead and uh, press the shutter yeah. button. We can see that we've got a yellow box around Sean's face, and we have a crosshash right over Sean's eye. Now, if Sean starts to turn away from camera, eventually it loses Sean's face because it no longer sees a face. So there is no face and eye detection. When Sean looks back at the camera, now it focuses back on Sean's face and eye. So what most people want is not face and eye detection most of the time. What they actually want is what we call human detection. So with human detection. <laughs> this is always a fun part when it's yeah. not back in my studio. We actually have like a, a real production here. And I have a whole monitor right I can look at. It's great. So when I go to human detection, people think that with human detection you lose face and eye. But the truth is, is that human detection is parts of a human. So it's going to have a hierarchy. We first want to detect the eye. That's like the most important thing. If we can get that eye in focus, that's what we're going to detect. And then you get the yellow box around the person's face. But Sean, why don't you turn in profile? So it no longer sees his eye. It no longer sees his face. So now it chooses a head. So now we are in head detection. Now Sean, why don't you go ahead and turn around so we can get. So now that we are turned backwards, it still detects his head. I got to get a little further away. Sean, why don't you slide down the couch just a little bit? Now what's happened is, because it doesn't detect his head anymore, it now switches to a body or torso detection. So the point is, is that if you're going to be following people walking around, what we want is you actually want human detection, not face and eye. And then we also have an option called animal and human. So we can add some complexity, dogs, cats, birds. I am not going to bark for you. No barking? No. Can, uh, uh, hippopotamus, we can detect hippopotamus as well. So the point is, is that we have all of these options available to us in the camera. Now, now that we understand 
where we want to start, which is the full area. Yes. So we're going to start in full area, and we're going to start in human detection. So as we begin to learn more about the camera, we may find that we don't want full area because we might be shooting a wedding and there might be a bunch of people around and we want to make sure that just the bride or the groom are in focus. So what we would do then is instead of using full area, we could use like zone detection where it's going to give us a, a moderately sized zone. Or we can go to one area and just put a, a pinpoint box on that person. Or one of my favorites, and I think you like this mode as well, um, one area plus human is awesome because what it does is it gives us a box. And I'm going to move this box around with a joystick. So you'll see the yellow box, which I can make bigger or smaller. Everybody should notice he went out of focus because the box is not on Sean. So now, Sean, you're the pony of hope now. You're out of focus a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. I, that's a little joke for those of you who are camera conspiracy fans. So as we move this box closer to Sean, you'll see that there's these outer brackets. As those outer brackets get close to Sean, if I hit set, now Sean's in focus and it recognizes there's a face near the bracket. So now it's picked up face. So all I have to do is whatever's in this box, if there's a face or a body, it's going to choose face, body, face and eye, whatever we need to use. So the point being is that if you want more control over the autofocus system, that's where we use the one area or one area plus. Okay. So now, Matt, what, what about you know with with all of these like these modes and and how that system works? You know, the, there's more customization in with with how this works. So what if someone is not you know maybe it runs really fast and typically can outpace how fast the system is set up by default do we have any settings to make that easier for them yeah so uh, when we're tuning an autofocus system it's kind of like tuning an engine in a car right yeah so we have to design it in a way that we think most people are going to use it not everybody's Hussein Bolt, so we don't need something that's going to be lightning fast because with other moving people, it's going to look jarring if it's just, you know, frenetically moving in focus. So we have the ability to customize the autofocus system. So what we do is we go to the camera's menu. Um, I've been recording this whole time, Sean. You have some uh, interesting video on your camera right now. You know what? That's perfectly fine. So. What we do is we go to the focus menu and you'll see we have AF custom settings for video. We have separate settings for photography as well. So just remember, separate settings, photo and video. So what we can first do is go to the set setting option and here's where we can adjust the speed and the sensitivity of the system. And so Sean has customized this to be faster. Um, I would not normally do that. I would sh set this to, sorry. The default settings, so if we hit display info, defaults will be zero and zero. So we're just going to set them to zero and zero. And this will be the default setting. So the top option is AF speed. Yeah, this is literally how fast will the lens focus. So if you're running quicker, it'll focus faster, slower, it'll go slower. AF sensitivity is how quickly will it transition from something new coming into the frame? So let's say somebody walks in front of you. We don't always want this thing to just jump to them. You know, If someone's walking right here, you, those of you who are watching us don't want to see it shift focus to that person for a fraction of a second. So this allows us to either be more locked on or more responsive depending on what we're doing. But what I think is most important, and this is incredibly important for you Lumix users out there, do not use the settings you've been using for all of the GH cameras, S-series cameras. Do not assume that this needs the same sort of tuning that you used on your old camera. You will be very disappointed if you're using the old settings. That's the whole point of us switching to this phase hybrid autofocus system. So start with the default settings before you start messing around and tweaking it. And remember, don't immediately dial in your favorite settings for the GH6. I think you're going to be really disappointed with the results if you do that. Yeah, you know, it's it's that we we've worked with the the previous system for years at this point, and while yes, there are going to be situations where you know maybe 
my style of shooting, like when I would like to photograph the motorcycles. And, and you know, going a little bit of a different kind of scenario here with the photography side of it, when I want to go out and, and photograph motorcycles, you know, the straight up out of the box experience is designed to be very flexible. So for just the everyday person that wants to work with the camera, so wedding photographers, event photographers, videographers, things like that. But with things like motorsports, that's super fast. It's much faster. So what's cool is that, as Matt was saying, there is the customization settings, but also for photo as well. And in the photo side, we actually make it a little bit more simple for that, since you know you typically have a couple of different styles that you basically stick to, and that's it. Yeah, portraits, maybe yeah. motorsports. Yeah. Yeah. So we have all four of those options available. So you have like uh, set one, which is going to be the default out of the camera. Set two, three, and then my favorite with the motorcycles is set four. But we also updated all of the settings for it. So what it means now is. You don't necessarily have to think like, well, by this description, is this going to match how my, my photography is going to look? It actually goes in and you say that I'm doing motorsports, I'm doing basketball, I'm doing, you know, football or, you know, just general basic. We gave you some of that guideline in the system to use it now. So as Matt was saying, like, when you first get the system, don't play with any of those settings yet. Try it out of the box first. Figure out what, what it actually is doing and where you want to see it change. Because the settings that you do make adjustments in this, you move something by one, it's a, it's a totally different you know, performance level. Well, I think the behavior is a little bit different now in the system because of phase. Like in the past, you'd really have to kind of play with both sliders to get the speed where you wanted it to. Yep. Anymore, if you need it faster, just use speed. If you want to make sure it stays locked on a subject, just adjust responsiveness. That phase autofocus really does the rest of the work for you. So um, kind of fail our way first, <laughs> and then make some adjustments to get it where you want it to be. Yeah. And I think um, something I completely forgot to mention at the beginning of this is for everyone that's joining us on the YouTube channel, we're here to answer your questions about it, too. So just like all our normal streams, if you got a question, just tag it. I'm reading the questions here. So, uh, you know, the, the, there's a couple super cool things that I've seen as I'm just going to look for questions while we're doing this. You know, when we talk about uh, lenses in the focusing system, I've seen a lot of people commenting, you know, on Facebook, Instagram, our, our YouTube videos. My you know, space, space yeah, sure. Okay, awesome. <laughs> you know, they, they're asking, like, okay, so, well, what about lenses? You know, do the Lumix lenses need updates? Do, you know, how's the performance with the, the rest of the L-mount members, with Sigma lenses, with the Leica lenses? Um, I know you, you've had a lot of experience working with it too and, and getting a lot of the feedback from people. What would you tell them? Well, why don't we start with what, we, what they should expect from a Lumix lens, right? So if you have a prime lens, no need for a firmware update. They're gonna work perfectly fine. Um, if you have one of our zoom lenses, they're going to work fine just like they did on your S-Series camera that you already had. They're going to behave exactly the same as the S-Series, just with much better autofocus. Um, but there will be a firmware update to add a feature we couldn't do with our old cameras, which is while you zoom, have it focus as it's zooming. So we just couldn't do that without phase autofocus. So that requires a firmware update to unlock that feature in the lenses. Uh, but no need to buy a new lens. It's going to be there with a firmware update, which is going to be great. Now, for me, I'm excited for it because I'm an Alfred Hitchcock fan, and I would love to be able to do that, you know, Alfred Hitchcock style dolly zoom where you make the background compress in while the subject doesn't change perspective at all. So that makes it super simple. The camera does the focus. I just have to move forward and zoom, and it makes my life easier. Why am I not surprised? Dude, I'm a huge nerd when it comes to cinematography, so that's why. <laughs> Now, if we could just get Panasonic engineers out there listening, an anamorphic autofocus lens that I could do a dolly zoom effect, we would sell exactly five of those lenses. I'm telling you, it would be worth all the investment. Anyways, back to you, Sean. What yeah. about for what about photography? I'm sure you're excited for that as well, right? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, with with this setup, you know, the, the fact that we have the Elmont Alliance and with the like crazy number of lenses, over a hundred native lenses on on the platform, and and I use that word specifically, native lenses. 
it means that I can I can jump back and forth. We've got our lenses. We've got the the, the entire f 1.8 series, which are truly my favorite lenses that we've ever come out with. Yeah. 24, 18, 35, 50, 85. Yeah. But it means that I can also go and play around with my 45 f 2.8, the uh, contemporary lens from Sigma. You know what I love? Which one? That 28 to 70 Sigma. I'm well, a big yes. fan. It's a great lens. And I, I, I got a chance to shoot with that thing for like a month before we launched the camera. And it's just so compact, lightweight. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. But what's, what's so different about this go around from, the, la from the, the first setup of the cameras that came out for the L mount yeah. from us is that they truly work as native now. So you're not having to worry about, you know, hey, is, is this going to, is anything being given up because I want to go with, you know, the Sigma lens because I like the Sigma lenses or, you know, I really love, you know, the Aposumicrons. Well, no, you're not giving up anything by going to any of these manufacturers because we're all within the Elman Alliance. We are all designing around this standard for it. And it is truly a, a, a shift to the way we've all thought about, quote unquote, secondary lenses. So, That's it, just not the case anymore. Well, I mean, we're going to get the most out of that autofocus motor that's supplied because we're working together, right? There's no yeah. kind of hidden agendas here. There's no secrets when it comes to that part of the, uh, the alliance, right? But even little things like all the buttons are programmable on those lenses and can be assigned to just about anything you'd want in the camera, which is amazing. Um, when I use the uh, image stabilization, so that was like the aha moment for me. So. We had a 150, uh, to, we had a 150 to 600, the Sigma, and I was able to use that lens at 600 millimeters, okay? Now, in body stabilization, it's only supposed to be five stops, right? And I don't know what the stops are on there in lens stabilizer, but the dual IS actually works with that lens. So I was able to use an, a 600 millimeter Sigma lens and I got that thing down to a sixth of a second for a handheld shot. It was crazy to be able to actually have a dual sync lens, dual IS lens, that was not made by Panasonic. So uh, Matt, I'm getting a cue over here from, uh, yeah, from, from Mr. Dan Unger here, Dan's that he's handing Dan me Unger. something here. So, um, so this is for the X. So we have a uh, video maker best of CES 2023 awarded to the S5 Mark II X. Yeah. So we're uh, breaking that live right now on the Lumix Live channel. So this is awesome. And, and Thank you, Video Maker. And honestly, they were literally just like shuffling in front of us, distracting us, trying to tell us that they had this coming. Dan, you're the least subtle person on the planet when it comes to this. Thank you for that. But thank you. No, this is this is super cool, super awesome. All right. So um, I want to take a look here. There, there were a couple questions that people had. Um, I know that we're moving away from the the subject there, but we got about eh, ten more minutes left here. Okay. Um, uh, Trina Media was asking, uh, regular on the Lumix live streams here, so it's great to see you still following us even though we're not on our normal day. Um, it says, can you explain the new active track and how it is enabled? So um, this actually does go hand in hand with our focusing system. You right. know, we, we, for those that don't know, with the Lumix cameras, um, the newer ones, so BGH series, the S series, the S5 Mark II uh, platform is going to, to support it as well. Um, we have this unique ability when you're working with our cameras and you're attaching them over USB to the DJI Ronin series, the RS2, RSC2, and then now the RS3 platform. So some of you in the audience may not know what a Ronin is. That's those gimbal things that you mount a camera to and they walk around with. So just so everybody here knows. Yeah. So, but w what this allows you to do is uh, DJI has that system called ActiveTrack which means the system is going to be able to follow and auto, like move the gimbal on its own based on a point or a subject that you're giving it. Well, our engineers and the team over at DJI have found a way to use our subject detection system and our motion prediction capabilities so that when you have the camera set in full area and you're using human detection, which Matt was just pointing out, that is the probably the best setup to be using for a lot of people in some areas. Yeah. Yeah. So when you set it up this way, you can now literally have a gimbal that you're walking around with or setting up as a, you know, kind of like super simple, easy access PTZ style solution if you needed it. 
yeah. and it'll just follow you around. Yeah, you set it up, you turn Active Track on, and the beauty is that you no longer need any of the extra accessories from the DJI side. It's integrated directly between our camera and their gimbal. So it, it's, it's such a cool setup. We've demoed it before on Lumix Live when we're back in the studio, and it's, it's just, it's so much fun and it's such like an eye catcher when we're at a show and you have it set up and someone walks by and we sneakily just like lock it on them and then all of a sudden the, camera, the gimbal's just randomly following them. It's, it's so cool. So but, but hopefully question, Trini that- But the question was, how does it work on the camera? And the answer is, we don't know yet because it's not quite ready with the firmware. These are still not production cameras. So we haven't got a chance to check it yet but we have seen it on the GH6, and it's a monster on the GH6. It works great. Yes. And now you just have awesome, awesome autofocus to go with it. So if it's anywhere as good as the GH6, you're going to love it because the autofocus is just monster on this camera. Yeah. Now, you know, there's, there's other, you know, kind of cool things when it comes to the, 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 the focusing in general with our system because I think what a lot of people you know, kind of get caught up in, especially for those of us that have been working in the Lumix lineup or, you know, we, we've been working with DFD for such a long time is that just because we've added, you know, the DFD system and we've moved in and used our, you know, decade plus of experience in subject recognition and, and the contrast side of it doesn't mean that we've ever, you know, taken out any of those other kind of features that may be a little bit lesser known when it comes to the autofocus. So, with a lot of things, they, there are some situations where, yeah, you've got the best autofocusing system in the world, but you really want to be using manual focus because you want that hypercritical ability to control and, and you know, you may want to actually override the autofocus. So we still have the functionality in the camera that with the option of just selecting it, when you're half pressing in the photography world, you half press, it locks onto focus, but then you have the option to do AF, MF uh, override. So while you're holding, you still can then refine your, man, your manual focus there. You can last second change it without moving your focus point. But I think one of the things that you pushed for, I think really hard with it and have been really going along with is the linear manual focusing functionality. Yeah, we, we were big fans of having a linear focus <laughs> set up for this. Um, so to Sean's point, for people who want more control over the manual focus, Yes, you absolutely lock on with auto and then you can manually focus. Um, but what we allow you to do, and I'll pull this up on the menu now, um, what we allow you to do with our lenses, and this is in all the S series, um, and what's funny is you can actually do this with, I think, almost every Sigma lens. Some of them will have varying degrees of adjustment, but they basically all can do this as well. Um, what we can do is we go into the camera's lens menu, and from the lens menu, we can go and choose Default is non-linear, which means that if I turn the lens real slow, the, rent, the focus ring slow, if I turn it slow, it's going to maybe take like two rotations to go from close focus to infinity, okay? But if I go really fast with it, it's only going to take like 90 degrees to do that, which, you know, that's great for photography, but it's not really useful for video at all. Um, so what we have the ability to do is we can go to set, and we can choose the degrees of rotation we want. So if I'm doing macro work, I can literally take 1,080 degrees, <laughs> which is what, like three turns of the lens, to go from close to infinity. Not useful unless you're doing macro work, but it's awesome for macro because you have tremendous granularity there, right? I prefer using 210 degree, that's kind of my go-to, because it gives me enough granularity so that I can, I'm not constantly missing the subject when I'm focusing on a little too far, a little too close, but I don't feel like I'm having to turn forever to get where I want. So you have that level of granularity that people have come to expect from our, our lenses. Um, and frankly, we've even added to the GH series now. Yeah, now for me, whenever I want to work in manual focus for photography, because I, I, it's just that mentality. I love, I, lo I love certain lenses like that 45 millimeter 2.8 that I was talking about. I love working with that manual focus. So in that case, I like setting that thing through Sigma's um, configure uh, solution. I like setting that thing to short, which is pretty much closer to like our 90 degree. Being able to do some street photography when I, you know, want to be a little more, you know, slow, a little more deliberate in what I want to do. I don't want to just use autofocus and let it just snap away. I mean, you can do that now with our cameras. 
But uh, yeah, I set that to 90 instead of the long ones. I want real quick, near to far on that. Yeah. Well, and, and keep in mind that we can do this with it. I know for the Sigma lenses, honestly, Sean and I haven't tried the Leicas for this to see. Um, but with the Sigmas, we have tried it. And it'll vary. Like, I know that 28 to 70, it's going to give you like a, a 90 degree option and then like a 360. So you're not going to get like as much granularity there. But on other lenses, they give you basically everything we give you. It just depends on the price point of the lens and what they're able to offer in it. Uh, but again, that's these are features you wouldn't get on any other camera with those Sigma lenses. So it's pretty cool. So before we move on, I want to ask you a question. If price were no object, which L mount lens would you have? What's your go-to? Ooh. We have like almost a hundred lenses to choose from. Oh, that's a good one. I know, I got mine in my head. So you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah. Like a 90 millimeter F2. Okay. Small, compact, beautiful bokeh. All right. And it has All that right. red L on it. Looks beautiful. Yeah, it does. So I, I guess you know what I, I I'd have to say. It cannot be Panasonic. It cannot be Panasonic. That's the rule. Oh, okay. Non Panasonic. Okay. Of course, we'd all take all the Panasonic. We work here. Come on. Yeah, I actually don't have to buy them. No. <laughs> you can borrow mine. Yes, that's right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, 35 millimeter Summicron. Of course. I, I knew that. I mean, you know, Summilux, Summilux, Summilux. You know, come on. Yeah. Had, had to be like it. Yeah. I, I share Chris's opinion on 35. So you, <laughs> you, I'm not a fan of the 35 <laughs> focal length either. So. All right, so let's see here. Um, we had a couple other questions that I think had come through here. Um, we are going to be, for those that are joining us uh, on the stream here, we are going to be uh, live again tomorrow. And we have different topics each day. So if I don't get to your question today, um, there's a lot in here that actually I'm, I want to purposely hold for the streams uh, that are on topic for them. Um, make sure to leave them in the chat. We've got them saved. We're going to record. Uh, review them and we'll, we'll have them ready for tomorrow. Um, but so the question that came in here was, will the GH6 get phase detect AF and a firmware upgrade? Now, this is something that, you know, obviously in the in the Lumix lives, our normal ones that we do at home, you know, we, 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 we like to speak very frankly with everybody. And you know, the fact of the matter is, no, it, it will not and it cannot. Phase detect hybrid AF systems are an entirely new hardware change to the platform. So now that we've added the, uh, the different sensor, the different architecture, and then on top of it, the L squared engine, you need all of these pieces together to make it work. So I, I know for those of you out there that are like, oh, you know, I, you want a firmware update, you know, maybe the pixels are hidden on the sensor. That's not how it works, unfortunately. I'm sorry. It's it is the new camera. Be the first. Yes. It's not possible for us to go back in time and make something else the first when it comes to the to the phase out of focus. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think looking at it right now, um, and then and anyone for all those others that were asking, everyone that's ever joined Lumix Live, you all know the the deal. If you ask us about things that are going to be coming in the future, you know what the answer is. Even if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. Um, but yeah, uh, I think we're the GH45. Is that was the okay? Yeah, someone wants to see GH6 updates. Um, lots of congratulations in the in the chat. So thank you everybody for for the congratulations. This is this things like this that we do to the camera. This is because of the community. This is because of the photographers, the videographers, those that that go out of their way to give us constructive criticism and feedback. So. Again, to the, to the Lumix community, to the Lumix Live community, thank you all so much for everything that you've done with us to help us get to this point and to help us refine and point us in a good direction. You're our engineers, honestly. The people who are out there using the product, you guys are the ones who've engineered this product. It's your feedback that's ultimately delivered the product that we have today. Yeah. And actually with that, we are going to have to wrap up here today now. So um, thank you, everyone uh, that's joined us online. Thank you, everyone that's been hanging around in the booth, listening to us ramble on about autofocusing. Thank you, Matt, for, for spearheading that and going through the demos. This is super fun. Thank you, Sean. We'll be talking tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we will. All so right. uh, we're going to be streaming again tomorrow at 11 AM uh, Pacific Standard Time. So uh, if you want to continue, Take, take a look at the uh, setup there. If you're on the YouTube channel and you like these kinds of conversations, we do these conversations every single week, Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And if you think we earned it, 
give us a subscribe, like the video, share it to people that you think are really interested in this kind of stuff or just have been asking these questions. Um, but yeah, with that, thanks everybody. Um, we'll talk to you all tomorrow.